As Chuck mentioned, um, there is a risk that's different than the normal risk that uh, most of you are getting training about. Training conference like this. Um, like I locked, walked in the last time we did this, Chuck, I came right after the guy that was giving people different types of shooting positions. And so when they introduced me, they said, now Greg's going to teach you the correct shooting position if you catch someone molesting a child. And he's like, no, 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 we're not. We're going to try to help you prevent any of that happening so you don't have to shoot anybody. All right? So let me tell you a little bit about who I am, and then we're going to buckle up, and I'm going to give you some information. But I know that there's no way I can give you all the information that I would like to. Okay? And here's what I'm going to do to solve some of that problem. Give me your first name, last name, and email address, and I want to give you the mother load of information because what I understand about people that are in risk management is as I describe to you what this risk looks like and then how we reduce the risk, what I know is there is this spectrum or this waterfront of where churches, when I ask you to evaluate where you are on that spectrum, some of you may be here, some of you may be here, some of you may be here, but the goal is everybody needs to get here. So the tools you're going to need to wherever you find yourself on that spectrum to get to where you need to be, I want to equip you with what you need to get there. Now, one thing in particular, because I've already met some people here from South Carolina. There's plenty of people here from Texas, a lot of Colorado people. That's an interesting combination of states for me because we also, with what I do for a living, we watch the changes in the law. So there's been some changes in the sexual abuse reporting codes for Texas, South Carolina, and Colorado. So if you want that analysis of the law, also write that on your card. Whatever you hear me talk about and you want it, write it on that card. This is my way of having to not travel with truck trailers full of notebooks, trying to anticipate what you might need. Now, who am I and why did Chuck ask me to visit with you? I practice law in Fort Worth, Texas. At least that's where my main office is. I have a nationwide practice of law that involves only sexual abuse matters, okay? Didn't go to law school in the 80s and deciding someday I want to be a sexual abuse lawyer, okay? There actually was no area of the law at that point. My wife and my, is also my law partner. She was an employment lawyer by trade, wound up representing a seminary student from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary that got fired for trying to report sexual abuse, okay? Now, you can fire someone in the state of Texas for dang near anything. You can't fire somebody for trying to comply with the reporting codes. That wound up being a 22 plaintiff sexual abuse lawsuit against a group home in Fort Worth that had been open for about 100 years. After about a $13.5 million result in that first wave of litigation, started getting calls in the mid-90s from entities all over the country saying, hey, I didn't know this was worth money. You know, because this is right when the Catholic Church was beginning their adventure into child sexual abuse matters. Okay? So it's like, hey, will you help me sue this entity? Hey, we can make millions on this entity. Now, most of those people that contacted us were wanting us to sue churches. Okay? Now, it's an important part of my resume and who I am. See, Kim and I are also believers and we're also in church leadership, which means I'm not interested in suing the body of Christ. Okay? Now, there are plenty of people who are, okay, but that's just not who we are. Okay? Actually, I'm in my 22nd year of student ministry at Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth. Okay? So I'm not just a, a writer of tools, I'm actually a doer of those things as well. Okay? So, Two parts of our work that I wanted to mention to you right off the bat. Number one, we litigate. Now, I won't sue the church, but I will sue the Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? It's like therapy for me, all right? Okay, so we just finished a case in San Diego. That was a $4.1 million verdict. Who knows when we'll collect it, but hey, it was therapeutic, all right? So there's the litigation part, but then there's also the prevention part, okay? It's the answering the questions of, hey, we just heard about somebody's black eye. Can you teach us what we need to know so that we don't get one? It's like, now that's a good question. Now, sadly, it's the secular world that's asking that question more often, okay? So, like, we helped write Safe Sport for the United States Olympic Committee right here in Colorado Springs, okay? We're working with all kinds of secular organizations and insurance carriers and insurance, you know, agents and brokers. But the challenge is my heart beats faster for the church. And see, in my world, that's where the barriers are the lowest. And I know you know that. Okay, so I won't go through the statistics or the psychology or the sociology as to why that is so. But if you ask me, hey, Greg, where in our culture are the barriers the lowest for sexual abuse? I would tell you it's the church. Okay? And it's growing. And it's going to continue to be the church. And I'll touch on that a little bit in just a minute. Now, the third part of our practice, which actually is growing more than I care for it to, is we're crisis response managers. All right? 
So I get probably two phone calls a day and usually they're churches. Okay, so right now I have 22 open files in my office of, a, of, a, of an entity in the ditch. So of those 22, 21 of them are churches, 20 of those are Baptist, okay? And there's a reason why, okay? It is not a coincidence. And in one of the, it's, every one of these are the same pattern, okay? So like when people call me up and they start telling me their story, I'm a nice guy usually, okay? So when you're telling me your story, I'll listen patiently for someone to share with me. These are the facts we're dealing with. After the first two sentences, I can finish your story for you. Okay? Because it has patterns. All right, so in my world of risk management as it relates to child sexual abuse, most of the instruction you're going to receive as a part of this program are going to involve risks of a more hostile nature. Okay? Active people that are wanting to come and do physical harm. But see, it, it's same concepts, different instruction. The concept is the same in the sense that we don't want to just teach you when that person pulls out a gun, this is what shooting position you use. The idea is, is there's a foreseeable risk. And if there's a foreseeable risk, what information, equipping, and training can we provide you such that you see things differently? So you can see when this person comes in, they wait a minute, that has my attention. Now they're going to have me greet them. Now you're going to show visual. I mean, you got identifying the risk and have ways in which you deal with it based upon what you identify. My world is the same, Okay. Because in my world, there's a risk that unfolds that is not intuitive, okay? People don't understand how this risk unfolds. But if I can equip you with the information to understand how this risk unfolds, if you can see it, then you can prevent it, rather than being those people that call me up on the phone because the train is off the tracks, okay? So rather than going and building all this up because we have a limited amount of time together, I wanted to go ahead and just skip right to the answer at the back of the math book, okay? Here's the big idea. The key to prevention is understanding the grooming process. Okay? Plain and simple. All right now, the grooming process, just a shortcut to get to the back of the book and then build us to the place where that can unfold it for you, is the process by which an abuser will go to prepare a child for inappropriate sexual touch. Okay? There's a definition. Have I helped you at all? Probably not. Okay? But I want you to hear it up front. The key is the grooming process. All right? Now, let me unfold for you some of the common errors because here's what I know. When I talk to my church leaders, let me just, whether I teach in the seminaries, I teach at Southwestern and at Dallas Theological Seminary, and here's the way normally I'll kick off my classes, is asking people in vocationally in ministry, here's the question that rolls off my tongue, secular or, or faith-based organization, what are you doing at your organization to protect children from sexual abuse? Okay? I mean, I ask that question all the time. Now, there's an answer I'm looking for, but let's go ahead and ask that here. Everybody here, I suspect, is somebody associated with risk management. Okay, now, when I'm addressing people in a seminary class or a pastor's conference, that may not be so, but it is true in this room, okay? So if there is a risk associated with your ministries, and I'm going to ask you what you're doing at your particular ministry to reduce that risk, I suspect you would be one of the key people that I would ask or someone would go to you to find the answer to this question. Okay, what are you doing at your ministries to reduce the risk of child sexual abuse? Now, here's the Christian answer. Okay, number one on the, on the list, people are going to tell me about their background checks, right? Everybody say right. Okay, come on, right? All right, thank you. Front row is strong, all right? People are going to tell me about their background checks. There's a lot to say about criminal background checks, but it's like that hook dropped in the water, and I'm just going to refuse to bite it right now, okay? But nonetheless, back to our list. Usually the next thing that winds up on the list, in my experience, whether we're standing over a train wreck or we're dealing with somebody on the preventative side or just on the instructional side is, people will tell me about their child check-in system. Everybody tracking with me? Child check-in system? All right. Then I get policies. Now, just so you know, I've got it in the little quotes up here, and here's the reason why. Policies means a number of different things to different people. I remember being in Garland, Texas with a, a group of leadership where the student minister was arrested as a sexual abuser. There's a handful of teenage girls that had come forward and I'm around this table. It's like, all right, people, the media is waiting for talking points. Law enforcement wants to know if you're going to participate. We're going to need some answers. So first of all, people, do we have some policies and procedures? And they're looking at me like, yeah, we got policies, lawyer boy. Okay, it's like, all right, I feel shamed, but good. Now, I'm going to need to see a copy of those policies. Well, they're, they're not written down. What do you mean they're not written? You might as well not have them, 
okay? So we got through that particular day, but I went back in there because I felt shamed, okay? I said, no, wait a minute. Earlier when I asked you if you had policies, and you looked at me and said, yeah, lawyer boy, we got policies. What did you think I meant? I said, well, I mean, it's our policy that there's a zero tolerance for sexual abuse. We have a policy that sexual abuse is abhorrent. That's dang near worthless, okay? So to them, policy meant a declaration of that we don't approve of sexual abuse, right? Now, on the other hand, I've had people tell me, well, yeah, we've got policies and procedures. We'll be right back. And they come back with something that looks like war and peace, okay? It's like, conk. I was like, well, what is that? That's our policies. I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, I hope you're doing everything in here because this is now the yardstick that will measure your performance, Okay? And it turns out as you flip through this, it was partially from the YMCA and partially from the Boy Scouts of America, and they didn't even word process YMCA out very well. Okay? So, deep cleansing breath. What I wanted to share with you is when I ask the question, normally people will tell me about their policies, but policies can mean a number of different things. Okay? But let's go ahead and leave it on our list. Okay? Beyond that, for the church, we start splintering into more of rules and guidelines than systems. Okay, people will tell me about their, their six-month member rule. Everybody with me on that for volunteers? Okay, or their, their two-adult rule. Still tracking with me? Now, some actual ministries have, have budgets for video cameras and the like. Okay, some of you may have that, all right? So, but nonetheless, if that winds up on your list, make that mental list for me now. Because as we go through this information, what I want to show you is there's some common information that people hold on to that give rise to what they do. That's kind of the big idea is what we believe shapes what we do. It's not unlike the gospel. Everybody with me on that? Okay. What we believe shapes what we do. The problem in my world standing over these train wrecks is not that people don't care enough about their children. Okay. You see, the problem is we believe wrong things or not enough of the right things. And as a result, what we do suffers. Okay. So when I'm meeting people that are in difficulty or just simply want to ask me if they're doing okay, and I ask the question, hey, what are you doing to protect children from sexual abuse? I'm going to get their answer. Based on what you tell me, I know what you believe. All right? But see, it's not important enough that I know what you believe. It's important that you understand the right things. But see, by having that dialogue with you, it at least identifies for me where do we need to start our conversation. Okay? So because I can't deal with each of you individually, what I would rather do is I'm going to back up to 30,000 feet and I'm going to identify for you the three big baskets of the most common misconceptions that wind up to this list that winds up in the ditch. Okay? Because if I can undo those and then give you the good information that goes back in, now we have a place to build from. All right. So here we go. Facts versus misconceptions. What are the facts? All right, as an overarching concept to kick us off into that, I want to make this summary statement, which I know this group can track with me. We can't reduce a risk we don't understand. Okay, and in my world, it's not unlike September 11th. Okay, how many of you know exactly where you were when you saw the buildings come down? Okay, yeah, if you're like me, it's like burned in the back of my brain. I know which couch I was sitting on. I know who was in the room with me. I know which commentator I was watching going through this. And I know when that first plane hit the building, it's like, all right, that, somebody's an idiot, okay? What were you thinking driving that close next to that building? Now, when the second plane hit, it's almost like, uh-uh. We're, we're in a brand new category, aren't we? Okay, it's like, I don't know what that category is exactly, but I know that life will never be the same after that, all right? Now, but you see, here's the question. Did terrorism begin on September 11th? Answer, clearly, No. But did we know that then? Okay, it's if you're like me, you're just like, one, who would do that? I mean, did we like beat them at World Cup or something? I mean, it's like, Al, what? Okay, it's like, we just need to go bomb somebody, right? It's like, what I realized at that point is, you see, my learning curve, what I believed about terrorism was very, very thin. And it was, my government's was too, okay? The bank of information I was relying upon didn't have a lot of good information in it. But I promise you, because of that circumstance I watched unfold in New York and in Pennsylvania, you know, and in Washington, D.C., my learning curve changed dramatically over the next 90 days. Didn't yours? 
Okay, I started to learn a great deal about terrorism after that point moving forward. Okay, but watch this. What we believe shapes what we do. Okay, so when I flew to come down here, you know, I had to take off most of my clothes and stand in this little tubey thing like this. Okay, I really don't know what the tubey thing does. Okay, but I didn't complain. Do you remember the good old days when you could meet your family at the gate? My kid has no concept of that and never will. Okay, but when I went through the tubey thing, I didn't complain because what I understood about the risk changes what I'm willing to participate in. In fact, I wanted everybody on my airplane to have gone through the tubey thing too, all right? So it's the idea of terrorism was moving around us the entire time. We just didn't know what it looked like. But that changed, and it took something extraordinarily urgent to get me to change what was going to go into this bank. Sexual abuse, likewise, has been moving around us the entire time. We just don't know what it looks like. And sadly, it takes a burning buildings type of circumstance to force us to have to change what we believe. The goal of an event like this is, help me understand what I need to know about this risk so I can take steps to reduce it, all right? So that's kind of the concept I want us to work from is that we don't have good information in. Let me show you how the poor information leads to the plan that leads to the ditch so we can avoid, we can learn from other people's black eyes, okay? Facts versus misconceptions. These come in big baskets to me. It's like one, two, three. Okay, and here's how I've made these baskets. I didn't read a book or, or some kind of study. It's just from straight up practical experience of standing over train wrecks for 22 years, okay? And it looks like this. When I ask you the question, hey, what are you doing at your church to protect children from sexual abuse? Usually at that point, we can still be friends, all right? Because like, well, I love my children. Let me show you what we're doing, okay? And you're gonna make me your list. And then I'm gonna ask you the next question and generally, that's when people crinkle up their face and they back up a little bit. And the next question is, well, why aren't you doing more? Now, whatever you say next is going to tell me which misconception you're holding on to. Okay? And here are the big three. The first one, when I say, hey, what are you doing to protect children from sexual abuse? It's like, well, here's our list. Well, why aren't you doing more? The first big basket relates to the significance of the problem. All right, now, I'm not, don't mis, misunderstand me. I've never had anybody look me in the face and say, Greg, I think you're a liar, and it's just not that big of a deal. Okay, it used to be in 1999 and 2000 that people would tell me, well, Greg, you know, I, I understand it's a big deal, but we're not Catholic. I'm like, seriously? It's like, yeah, if they just let those priests get married, they'd leave those little boys alone. All right, that's messed up, okay? But I don't hear that as much anymore. Here's the most common way this is expressed to me. Greg, I want you to understand, I know it's a big problem, but this is who we are. Sexual abuse is what happens out there. And usually it's my small churches that are telling me that, you know, Greg, we know everybody. It's a small community. There's like three generations of, sexual abuse happens in those big churches. You know, it happens in the big city. It happens in that racial group. It happens in that socio, it's one way or another, you're gonna describe to me who you are and tell me how sexual abuse is somebody else's problem. Okay, I'm just here to tell you, sexual abuse is an equal opportunity employer, okay? It cuts across all the demographics, denominations, socioeconomics, and racial profile. I mean, okay. But there's more important to understand is, you see, the size of the problem is enormous and it's growing, okay? So the conservative studies tell us there are 60 million sexual abuse survivors in the U.S., Okay? Given a population of 300 million people, that's one out of five Americans had been sexually victimized before he or she was 18. Okay, that's extraordinary. Okay, I know you know five people. One of them was sexually abused out of that five. Okay, lay that demographic down on this room and it's staggering. Okay, but here's something else I wanna teach you about that bank of information, okay, about sexual abuse. We all have one, okay? We all believe something about sexual abuse. But we don't talk about it, do we? Okay? Go into Starbucks and get your triple whip, a frap, a whatever, and it's like you don't go to the person next to you and say, hey, man, here's what I believe about sexual abuse. How about you? Okay, those words will never leave your lips. Okay? So generally, we all have a bank of information about sexual abuse. It gives rise to what we do, but we don't talk about it. It's usually private. It's very personal. And it's one of those things that we never get the opportunity to have what we believe refined by the opinions of others so that we can truly be holding on to good information. 
That's just the way it works, people. Here, we're going to break that open a little bit and shake up this bank, okay? Because I want you to see some of the errors so you're not understanding all this while I'm burning building situations happening at your ministry. In terms of moving forward, some people will tell me, Greg, I mean, I know. I mean, this present generation of children, they're just getting creamed. And it's like, whoa, no, 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 no. You see, the one in five number covers mostly our generations. If you want to talk about this new generation of children, the conservative studies are telling us one out of four girls will be victimized before she's 18. Okay? I have a teenager that calls me daddy. Okay, this quickly takes on name and face. But nonetheless, the guys, conservative studies say one in six guys will be sexually abused before he's 18. Now, notice there's an asterisk up here for the guys. You see, I chose the conservative number, the one in six. Some of the studies say one in four. Some say one in five. I chose the one in six just to be conservative. All of those numbers are unacceptable. But you see, the guy number can't be refined as cleanly as the girl's number. Why? Yeah, guys won't tell you, okay? Guys don't report. And see, here's a difficult concept for the church. You see, actually, 66% of sexual abuse victims won't tell you until they're adults, comma, if ever, comma, especially not guys. Now, here's why that's significant for the church. You see, we have a couple of things in common. Number one, we are a volunteer-driven organization, are we not? At least the evangelical church is, okay? And two, we never quite have the budget to meet the ever-growing demands to be the hands, feet, and voice of Christ in our community. As a combination of those two things, we wind up being very reactive. Okay, we wind up putting out the fire that's burning the closest to us. But you see, sexual abuse victims won't tell you. As a result, there is no fire that nibbles on your ankle to get your attention because they won't tell you. So by the time it gets your attention, it's usually a fire that's white hot and it's too late to do anything preventative at that point anyway. And the human cost has been high. All right, so we just need to understand no matter how you describe yourself, sexual abuse is an our problem and it's a today problem. And I'm here to tell you it's a whole lot easier to make changes when you're not under the fine white light, okay? So that's, when we're talking about the significance of the problem, that's good information. But here's what I've found. I could talk to you about the staggering numbers of victims, but that all by itself generally does not motivate change. Okay, it's like, it's like once again, let's go back to 9-11. You see, the urgency of the risk is what drives the urgency of the response. You tracking with me on that? Okay. And so if the urgency of the risk is not truly felt or understood, it's just more data that goes into your priority list that you try to get approved for your budget next year. So that's why I want to spin the diamond just a little bit and evaluate the size of the problem, not from the standpoint of the statistics relating to victims, but as it relates to abusers, okay? Because this one is mind-bending. Okay, it's like, why somebody wants to have sex with a seven-year-old? I got nothing, all right? I don't understand it, and so I can't necessarily understand how the risk unfolds, all right? But here, let's, let me give you just one example of information about the sexual abusers. It's generally not in this bank, risk managers, that desperately needs to be. Did you know the average male molester who prefers boys as victims will have 150 victims prior to criminal prosecution, if he's prosecuted, okay? Average male molester who prefers girls will have six, I mean, 52 victims prior to criminal prosecution, if he's prosecuted. By way of context, the average male molester begins victimizing at 13 or 14 years old, and the average age of criminal prosecution, if he's prosecuted, is 35. Okay, for most of my people, that's new information. Okay, and I hear risk managers, I'd ask you why? Why is that new? I mean, this isn't secret information. I don't have a membership to this, okay? And this is since it's important to me because I'm one of these people that wants to bring about change in ministry, I'm interested in the answers to those questions. Why isn't this already in place? Why isn't this already a part of your thinking and planning? And there's a couple of reasons why that I have found. Neither one of them are an excuse, okay? The first one is, it's gross, okay, isn't it gross? Is there anything more repelling, okay?
But you see, the way that we're wired as humans, it's almost as if, if it's gross, I don't want it. Okay, let me put it to you this way. My kid is now a freshman at Texas A&M, and I'm hearing all about this SEC football stuff, okay? I'm a Red Raider that I'm still a Big 12 guy, all right? But nonetheless, I mean, she calls me on Sunday morning, and she's all hoarse, and says, hey, we went to the game last night, and, and, and she kept using this phrase, which is curious. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? At first, I'm thinking, I can't see what you're saying. What a stupid phrase. But then I started thinking about it. It's like, well, you know what? That's exactly right. It captures how we cognitively process, okay? So when she's explaining to me, Daddy, you know, we, we were up in the stands and the marching band and the crowd was screaming and the fireworks. And you see what I'm saying? It's like when, while she's talking about that, I'm drawing upon experiences that I had in college of going to college football games. And I truly am developing something that I can see what she's saying based upon my experiences. Everybody tracking with me still? Okay, now take that same concept and when somebody starts to share with you because you're in that role about someone having sex with their seven-year-old, it's like, well, well, no, 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 no. It's like, I don't want to create a mental image of someone having sex with a seven-year-old. Are y'all tracking with me? Okay, and it's almost like, I want you to stop because seven-year-old and sex don't belong in the same sentence, okay? especially when somebody is not a professional risk manager, okay? Because I know that Pete, you are a care team for a lot of people that are out there putting their, their hearts and their souls on the front line to minister to people. You're the ones they expect to know the hard things, okay? And so if it's difficult for this crew, imagine how difficult it is to some of this other crew, all right? So for you, here's, here's the way I roll with this. I'm going to give you this information and I'm going to do it unapologetically. And the main reason is, is because you see, it's got to be hard for us so it doesn't become hard for them. Okay, it's almost like it's got to get on me so it doesn't become my daughter's experience. So people, we're the ones here on the front line that it's just going to have to be uncomfortable. But you see, that's the number one reason why this information doesn't come in in my experience. The number two reason is because it's not part of the way in which you receive information. Let me explain what I mean by that. When I start asking the question, okay, well, if this bank of information is part of the problem that I need to speak into, where does the information come from that forms what people believe? And here's what I've learned. This bank of information that all of us have one is generally informed by three avenues of information. One is your personal experiences. Two is the experiences of somebody close to you or dear to you. And three is the media. Okay? Now, let's do some testing. Will your personal experiences ever give you this kind of data? See, it's not possible. Okay, what about the experiences of your wife or a loved one or a family member? Again, you see, that's impossible. Okay, what about the media? You see, there's your only semi-objective source of information. Is it helping you? I'm here to tell you what. If those are the only three avenues of information you rely upon, you'll be dancing on the edge of the ditch all the time. Okay? Let me show you what I mean by that. You see, the media's job is not to equip you with good information to protect your children. Okay? The media's job is to make you go like this. <gasps> okay? It's to shock you and alarm you. You can see sexual abuse by these statistics is happening everywhere all the time. But what are the ones that you read about and hear about on the news? See, here's what, I, here's what I understand from the work that I do. The more trusted the organization is where a child was sexually abused, the closer to the front page it will get, okay? Because people otherwise would have been expecting that to be a safe place for a child. The Boy Scout troop, the daycare center, the Christian school, the church youth group. Okay? And people are alarmed by that, and that's what gets media attention. Okay, but when you read the media in terms of what it gives to you, have you ever noticed that the reports of sexual abuse always come in ones and twos and threes? Okay, they're never in dozens. Okay, it's the soccer coach with the kid on the overnight trip. It's the band hall director with the two kids in the band hall. I mean, it's, it's ones, twos, and threes. Okay, but here's the window. Generally, when the media is reporting about this, they are gathering information from an arrest record. 
And most of you who, if you're former law enforcement, you know that your job in law enforcement isn't to establish everything this person's ever done that was wrong. Your job is to get enough information of a violation of the law, give it to somebody that's gonna charge and move forward for a criminal prosecution, okay? So you don't need 18 victims. You just need one solid person and possibly get two or three more if this person's weak enough and you need corroboration. And that's what the media picks up and that's what they report. Okay, ones and twos and threes. Now, what I also want you to understand from the media is that's never the whole story. This is the statistics, but let me go ahead and give you, let's put some flesh on the bones for that. Who's the most media covered sexual abuser in the last 10 years? That's right, Jerry Sandusky, okay? We heard more information about sexual abuse, even on Sports Center while getting our hair cut, right? All right, so of all that information, that coverage that we got from Jerry Sandusky, you know, that reporting, how many victims did they tell you about? And that's notorious, he's a villain, most, sec most covered sexual abuser in the last 10, 15 years. How many victims? Say again? Yeah, there were, actually there were eight identified, and then there were two unidentified, there were 10 in the indictment, okay? But you know what, in our gut, we know there's more, don't we? There's more, isn't there? It's like my gut, oh yeah, there's more. Okay, how many more? Let your mind bend. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this to the test, apples to apples. If Jerry Sandusky were an average male molester, I think he's a prolific molester, let's go average, okay? Jerry Sandusky were an average male molester and he preferred boys ages nine to 15. Average male molester preferred boys has 150 victims prior to age 35. And Jerry Sandusky was 67 when he was arrested. What can we presume? Yeah, the experts will tell you hundreds of boys, hundreds, but the media never gives that to you. And here's one of the little windows into why. Because see, God made me to be a why guy. I'm just not satisfied with just facts, all right? Most of this data comes from the systems. See, when somebody's convicted of a sexual offense involving a child, generally you're required to complete the sex offender program before you're eligible for parole, okay? The first part of the sex offender program is someone having to pass a polygraph identifying how many victims in their names that they can remember, okay? It allows the parole system to understand their threat level. So they can assign a threat level and find out what type of training wheels, if any, to, to put on this person if they release them early. Everybody tracking with me? Okay, so by the time that information's even available, the media is done with it, okay? Jerry Sandusky hadn't even passed the polygraph, all right? So the data that we get, we need to broaden our understanding of the risk so that the urgency of the risk truly can be matched by what we do. Let me let you hear this from the mouth of a sexual offender. And by the way, this is convenient from the standpoint of Jerry Sandusky. Yeah, that was a media covered sexual abuser. This guy that I'm gonna show you is also a sexual abuser for boys in the same age and sexual preference as Jerry Sandusky, nine to 15. And he also accessed them using athletics, much like Jerry Sandusky did. But this guy, by contrast, has passed the polygraph. This man is a 33-year-old pedophile with an 18-year history of molesting children. He was sexually aroused by male children between the ages of 9 and 13. He was an athletic director at a school, and he operated by identifying vulnerable children and becoming close to them. A responsible man in other ways, he hid from himself the harm that he was doing by making a series of thinking errors. John told himself that abusing children was a way of loving them and that they wanted the sexual contact as much as he did. With the deviant attraction to children that he had and by using his thinking errors to ease his conscience, he was able to molest high numbers of victims without being troubled by it. I created my first male victim when I was 15. And I have been victimizing male children virtually nonstop until my incarceration. I have 11 male rape victims. I have one, one female rape victim. And I have approximately 1,250 male molest victims. And I say approximately, because I really don't know. There were times when I went a whole week, two weeks, three weeks without ever molesting anybody. And there were other times that I molested daily, two and three times a day. Uh, on average, 
I would say I molested five children a week over that 20 year period. Isn't that frightening? Now, I don't want to suggest to you that every molester is molesting in that type of numbers and prolific way. But people, if, if this is what the studies are telling us are the averages, we need to open our mind to what this risk looks like beyond what the media is going to tell us. And we need to understand this from the sense that I want you to have an urgent expectation of what priority this gets, but that only happens if we have the correct level of urgency associated with the risk. Now, let me go to the next basket, okay? The next basket in this is related to the fact that the problem is growing. It's amazing how many ministry leaders think that law enforcement is getting a grip on this. Okay, it's like, okay, well, no, 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 tap the brakes. Now, I don't want to get into the sociology of predation, but what I do want to do is drill down into, in my view, from the types of work that I do and the windows that I have to look into this risk, I want to share with you what I see as it relates to the church. Okay? So if I ask the question, which I already asked earlier, Here's the trifecta that's getting the church. Number one, sexual abusers go to where the barriers of protection are the lowest. Does that make sense? Yeah. Why someone wants to molest an eight-year-old, I got nothing. The fact that they would go to molest that eight-year-old where the barriers are the lowest, I get that. Okay, and I've already thrown out there to you, where in our culture are the barriers the lowest? The church. Okay, now, watch this. Here's where the secular world operates. Here's where the church operates. Okay, now I'm not suggesting you the secular world does it super, you know, perfectly or even well. I'm just suggesting to you that we're doing it better than we are. All right, but now people that say it's a Catholic problem. In 1998, the Catholic church raised their fences higher than anyone in the culture. Okay, now it's cost them about $3 billion so far. But I don't care how much it costs. I'm just, I'm just interested in where are the, the barriers the lowest. Okay, so the secular world, Catholic church, and here we are. All right, now here's what's been happening since about 98, 99, and 2000, is you see the secular world is moving because of legislation, licensure, sometimes litigation, okay? And the church continues to do very little. So in this growing problem, we are the low watermark. But see, it gets worse than that. You see, especially when I, I, I attend a Bible church, Okay, we're the backbone for most of the Baptist conventions along the Southeast, all right? But who cares? Because, well, I mean, I care deeply. But what I'm doing is I'm interested in understanding where is the risk. And of the things I mentioned to you earlier that I have all these Baptist allegations that we're trying to walk through crises, there's a reason why, okay? So over the last three years, I've been encouraged by watching the church is actually beginning to move. But the difficult part is it's moving denominationally because the reality is, like say for example with my Methodists, Methodists may get sued in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Okay, the conference is added to the party, the mothership is brought in, some money is paid, and then someone puts together a committee and they study it and then tell people, this is what we think is the glove that fits the hand of your ministry. So let's get that started. Now there may be some of these churches that are dragged kicking and screaming into a safety system, but they're getting there nonetheless. Okay? So my Episcopalians are moving. My Nazarenes got sued in Oklahoma City. They're moving. Okay? My Lutherans are moving. But you see, my independent non-denominational churches, my Baptist churches and my Bible churches are where, in my view, is where they still aren't doing anything because they don't have the same denominational and informational infrastructure to learn from someone else's mistakes. Everybody tracking with me? It's why these types of things are so critically important. But see, here's another piece that I need to add to that. You see, these are the first two points in the trifecta. But you see, when I stand over a train wreck with these groups, it's amazing to me how everybody thinks everything is going to be okay. And I'm saying, well, okay, well, it bends my mind. Why do you think everything is okay? Greg, because we got everybody's background checked. It's like, oh, fabulous, Okay. It's amazing to me how much of a security blanket that is for the church, okay? But I want to put some facts in for those of you who are risk managers. Here's the reality of the criminal background check. Did you know that less than 10% of sexual abusers will encounter the criminal justice system? Okay, the latest study out is less than 4%. <laughs> okay, now what that means in practice is, is even if Jack Bauer and CSI Miami teamed up to do your background checks for you, more than 95% of the people that wish to hurt our children have nothing for you to find, comma, and they know it, okay? Now, that's information that has to go into the bank. 
all you risk managers. Okay, but I want to caution you here, and this is just like therapeutic for me as well. I've seen somebody in church leadership take this information and respond poorly to it. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is put good information in so that you can do the right things, not wrong things. So I saw this guy, he, um, he caught me at dinner once in Fort Worth, and I had taught in the seminary about six months earlier, and he goes, hey, you're the guy who taught in, in Dr. Derwin's class, aren't you? He's like, well, yeah. He goes, I was in your class, and I want you to know that was great information. And I took that information back to our leadership, and we voted, and we saved $500 on our budget. And I said, that's awesome. How'd you do that? He goes, we stopped doing background checks. It's like, you're an idiot, Okay. I had to write him a letter on the law firm letterhead. I know I implied or suggested you stop doing criminal background checks, comma, you idiot, okay? See, my point isn't that it's, go, it's so thin that stop doing them. My point, see, we'll never stop doing criminal background checks, okay? And for many of your ministries, it was like you have a licensed daycare or in some of the, it's required, right? So it is what lawyers call standard of care. We will never stop doing criminal background checks. There's a lot of information I would like to share with you about criminal background checks and how they work and how effective they are in this realm and what is a red flag offense, what is a stair step offense, things like that. But once again, on the shelf for right now, for the sake of this information, we need to understand background checks are important, but they should never be the only thing we do, okay? It's part of a system, but it is not a standalone system. All right, so last basket. Now, this basket, I can give people information to understand that that security blanket really is the size of a dish towel, okay? And you go, Roger that, that's good information. I'll factor that in and that will then change what I do. Okay, that, that's an easier trip from information to change. This next one is not, okay? In fact, this next basket is the most difficult of all of them. And it's the idea that sexual abusers have no visual profile. Now, what I mean that, I mean, we can say that, you can write that down, I haven't served you, okay? Because you see, this one is actually dyed into the fabric of our wool. This is, this is wired into the way we understand child protection. And the best way for me to kind of illustrate this is, I remember when my kid, her name is Georgia, when Georgia was eight years old, and I remember going into Fort Worth in, in Denton Bible Church. Where's my Denton guy? Okay, you're gonna know Ridgemar Mall, Fort Worth. Okay, it's got one of those rave theaters that's attached to the mall. Okay, everybody with kid knows kids know, you don't park behind the theater, okay? Because that's where all the troublemaker kids are because they're all back there drinking, they're waiting for their buddy to pay for one ticket and come open the back door, okay? So you always park away from the back of the theater, but I'm not that smart, okay? So when we were Christmas shopping, it was daylight when we went in and it was dark when we came out. Took the first spot I could, it just happened to be behind the theater, all right? So here my kid and I, we've been Christmas shopping and we're coming out, she's about eight. And it's like, it didn't dawn on me until we're about halfway to the car and it's dark and it's like, well, that wasn't a good move. And sure enough, here comes this crew walking toward us. Okay, and they're troublemakers and they're cussing a lot and they're throwing their cigarettes at each other and it's just, it's gonna be ornery. And I realized at that point, there's just nowhere to go. We're gonna encounter this crew, okay? So as we get closer, you know, the adrenaline starts going. I pull my little girl in behind me. And it's at that point I realized I can take life or more likely lay down my life, you know, for my child at that point. And this kid shoulders me, some comment about my being old, I am, okay? But we get through it pretty quickly, but the adrenaline's still going, okay? So I get in the car and I'm not ready to drive yet. It takes a little while, the adrenaline comes down, start the car and go home, okay? That's an illustration of generally how we envision child protection, okay? So for me is if I see no thing that, to, that tells me there's a threat, I'm at a place of rest, okay? But when I get something in my environment that tells me uh, there's a threat, I get up for the fight until the threat is passed, and then I come down again. Everybody with me? I can't stay up all the time. I'll stroke out, right? Okay, so the idea is, is that's the way we generally move through life in the protection of our own children, much less anybody else's, okay? But that will fail us if we're trying to protect children from a sexual abuser. Sorry, I'm dying up here. So here's what I want us to understand about this concept. Sexual abusers have no visual profile. And as I mentioned to you at the beginning of this, this time we're gonna spend together, the key is the grooming process. So the big idea before I dive into this is you can't recognize this risk visually. You must understand this risk behaviorally. Okay, but let's finish this because you see this one is dyed in there and I don't want to shortcut this, all right? So I remember like what I realize now about my work is 
Growing up in Lubbock, Texas, I know there's Amarillo right there, right? Growing up in Lubbock, Texas, I grew up in a high-risk home. I didn't know that then. I grew up in a single mom home and we lived in an apartment complex right there off Slide Road, okay? And it's like, but it wasn't weird to have a single mom. Everybody in the apartment complex had a single mom, okay? Of course, I didn't know I was different from anybody else until I went to junior high. But nonetheless, as I look back now and I think about my mom and three boys, I mean, she had to be medicated. She's just not telling us, okay? But I look back and think of, you know, what kind of, what tools were we relying upon to protect ourselves from sexual abuse? I mean, all right, it's not like we just invented this problem in the last generation. So I look back into my world and I remember this concept, okay? Stranger danger. Y'all have heard that before, right? Y'all with me on that one? See, like in high school ministry, I'll tell my high school kids, like, well, yeah, on Saturday mornings when we watch cartoons and they say, well, why do you have to wait till Saturday? He's like, shut up, okay? In my world, cartoons came on on Saturday, right? Okay, you do your chores and then you can turn on the TV. All right, and right between how a bill becomes a law and conjunction junction, okay, there was always that little vignette where here's the little kids playing on the playground and here comes this dirt bag with a trench coat and he walks up and he goes, will y'all help me find my puppy? Okay, and all the kids stand up and they point and they yell what? Stranger danger, right? And the camera pans out and the adults over here are like, hark, and they come to help and the dirt bag runs away. Okay, so even to a child, as cheesy as that was, what's the message? Okay, if dirt bag approaches me and I raise the alarm, people I don't know will come help me and dirt bag will run away. Okay, it's like, it's like roger that, I get it. Okay, just between you and me, here's the, here's the big idea. It's really not a system of protection. It's consistent with how we're already wired. Really, that messaging is just trying to give the child the permission, if not the encouragement, to raise the alarm rather than to passively allow someone to snatch a kid off a, up a playground, okay? But here's the question I want to put on the table. That's a concept all of us are familiar with, and it's the most consistent with how we're already wired, but here's my question for you. Will stranger danger help you protect a child from sexual abuse? Okay? Okay, most of you are like, ah, oh, he seems to be getting that body language like the answer is no. I want you to clearly understand what the answer to this question is. And to be able to do that, I need to teach you about two types of sexual abusers. Okay, some of you are like, what? There's types? So yeah, actually there's four types. We're going to talk about two. Okay, the first type is the abduction offender. Okay, the abduction offender. This is your offender that gives rates like white van, you know, beanie babies in front of the elementary school, grabs the kid and goes. May have no relationship to the child or the child's family. Sees, he sees the opportunity, grabs the child. Could be the child walking home alone from the sleepover or unsupervised at the fall festival. We'll get the alerts on our phones. We'll see the signs on the I-25 you know, and, and usually we'll hear how the story ends a few days later and it's usually awful. Everybody tracking with me? Okay, your abduction offender. Now, of the waterfront of child sexual abuse, the abduction offender represents 4% of the problem. Okay, 4%. Sadly, for some of the people that wear your name tags, that's the only offender they know. Okay, I'm going to show you how that unfolds into the ditch. Okay, now contrast the abduction offender with the preferential offender. Okay, don't forget that word, preferential offender. Okay, the preferential offender like Jerry Sandusky's preferential offender, okay? Guy in the video, preferential offender. Preferential offender could be male or female, could have an age-appropriate adult willing to have sex with them, but prefers a child as a sexual partner. And not just any child. Generally, it's a child within an age and sex of preference, okay? Now, of the waterfront of child sexual abuse, the preferential offender represents 94% of the problem, okay? Now, we have a question on the table, is stranger danger valuable? But to go ahead and lock that down so that you and I will never miscommunicate, I want to take you to a case that we had to respond to so you can see how this unfolds into what I understand, what I do, and how I wind up into the ditch, okay? And this particular situation involved a children's ministry that operated, it's a larger ministry, children's ministry operated in a horseshoe-shaped building. Okay, so imagine if, with me if you would, a horseshoe shaped building with a fence across the top of the horseshoe. Okay, and it created a courtyard area in the middle of that horseshoe. Y'all tracking with me still? Okay, lots of windows looking out on that area and that was the playground for the little kids. Okay, so there was a structure, there was a bunch of chunked up rubber tire to make sure some kid didn't die if he took a header off the monkey bars, all right? So 
you had two staff people sitting on benches 25 feet away. And on this one particular Sunday, six-year-old boy woos four-year-old girl into the boxy structure of the playground and victimizes little girl. Okay. With staff members 25 feet away. Four-year-old girl goes home that afternoon and shares enough information with her parents and they believed her. Don't think that always happens. Okay. Parents called church leadership. Church leadership called Kim and me came out there that next Sunday and got there earlier before the other little kids came out on that playground, found those two ladies that were supervising that playground, said, can we visit for just a minute before the kids come out? They said, well, sure, they were delightful. Took them into a semi-private area and said, we need to talk to you about the sexual abuse situation that happened on the playground last week. And both of them said emphatically, that's not possible. It's like, okay, well, actually it is possible, but tell me why you think that, Okay. And both women said, because we have a fence. All right. Now, what we believe shapes what we do. What did they believe about what, where risk comes from? Outside the fence. Okay. So for them, as long as there were no ski masks, box cutters, or someone trying to make the fence, it was a safe day in children's ministry. What they didn't understand is that 94% of the risk happens on this side of the fence. Okay. Now, What we believe shapes what we do, but kind of here's the big idea as far as we're concerned. We have a question on the table. Is stranger danger valuable? Okay, and I know I need to ask a better question, okay? Will stranger danger help you protect your children from the abduction offender? Perhaps. Will stranger danger help you protect children from the preferential offender? Absolutely not. Okay? And not only will it not help you, it actually feeds the misconception that all abusers have some type of a look or a white van or something that you can recognize just like the child that you want to yell stranger danger. Okay? Now, let's take this into our church systems. Remember earlier I asked you to make that list. I know the church list. Criminal background checks usually makes the top. We've talked about that. Child check-in systems. Okay, well, let me ask you the question. Will your child check-in system help you protect children from the abduction offender? Perhaps. Will your child check-in system help you protect children from the preferential offender? Absolutely not. But see, no disrespect to your child check-in system. It never was meant to. That's not the purpose of that system. So I want to caution people, you can put it on your list... But please don't put it on any list that relates to reducing the risk of protecting children from a preferential offender, okay? Now, let's go varsity level with this, okay? Because number one, this actually helps us understand the statistics that more than 90% of children are victimized by someone they know and trust. And it's like, oh, well, with that kind of data about the preferential offender, that now makes sense, okay? And see, these two women that were on that playground, they loved Jesus and they loved these children. They just didn't have enough information to protect the children from the largest risk they faced, okay? That needed to change. We'll come back to that. Let's go varsity though. Let me set it up to you this way. Have you ever noticed that we do life with people who look like us? Okay, I mean, it's like, wow, I wonder, I'm thinking about all my friends, right? Remember when my child was born? My best friend said to me, she's like, Greg, she's beautiful. Do you realize someday she's going to choose your friends? It's like, what? No, she's not. It's like, yep, you're going to spend the better part of your adult life hanging out with the parents of the kids she chooses to play with. I said, I will not. I do. Okay, she's in college and I still do. Okay? Okay, but, but nonetheless, you see, we do life with people who have the same hobbies, live in the same neighborhoods, go to the same churches, who kids go to the same private school or public. You know, we do life with people who look like us. All right, here's the big idea. If my child, say when she was eight years old, if she were going to be victimized, who would the abuser in all cases look like? Me. That's exactly right, okay? They'd look like, see, I'm the one in charge of gathering the community in which she moves in. And so if somebody's going to victimize my child, chances are it's going to be somebody I gathered into that community, all right? So here's how this plays out in real life is you see, it's this duality of the allegation will oftentimes be difficult for you to believe about somebody difficult to suspect. 
Okay, like we mentioned earlier, when people start talking about, here are the circumstances this child is describing, and that's enough to derail us all by itself. Like, no, 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 stop talking. Okay, that, really? No. That couldn't have happened. And if you actually do let that information come in enough, and someone says, now who did that? And it winds up being somebody you hired who's on staff. Someone who's part of the family. Someone that you would have gathered into the community. Who went to seminary with you or whatever. This is what freezes my organizations. Okay? And my parents. So I want you to have heard it here first. Because your obligation when you have someone describing to you a, a sexual abuse or a suspicion of sexual abuse you are probably going to be required to do the next right thing. And the next right thing is probably going to involve making a phone call. And it's amazing how many people know that when I make that call, life will never be the same, okay? I'm going to impact this child's world. I'm going to impact this person's world. It's going to impact our building fund campaign. It's just, it's going to have things that I just kind of wish we could rewind to yesterday and this didn't exist, okay? So I get all kinds of people that are struggling here they fail to do the next right thing and they wind up in the ditch. So, you heard it here first, but in my opinion, that's what happened at Penn State. Okay? Here you got somebody that was a trusted pillar of the community. So when the information started coming in, it was difficult to believe about someone difficult to suspect. All right? Did you hear that the judge actually re released some information now? And they released the information that establishes that Joe Paterno knew about him being a sexual abuser in 1976. Did y'all see that? Other coaches knew in 1972. You see, that's consistent with all the information that we've talked about so far. But chances are you're not going to see this thing in full flower for several more months, if at all. You need to have enough information to know what to do when you do the next right thing. Okay, so for example, this guy, anything about him bother you visually? Okay, took a bunch of ministry money, opened an orphanage in Haiti, and then used education, clothing, food, and shelter to choose the boys within his age and sex of preference, woo them in, victimize them, then keep them quiet. Okay, but who's going to believe a Haitian orphan? Okay, wound up being a missionary couple. She would not let it go, and now he's doing a 20-year prison sentence in Connecticut. Okay, but see, difficult to believe about difficult to suspect is just killing my churches. All right? How many of y'all are familiar with Canicut camps in Branson, Missouri? Okay, it's like Pete Newman was an assistant director at one of those camps. I have friends of mine that they're in each other's wedding photos. Beautiful wife, beautiful child. Now doing two life sentences plus 30 years in a maximum security Missouri prison. Okay, your visual profile will fail you. We understand this risk by the behaviors, not the visual profile. This guy's from your neck of the woods. Okay, Longmont, Colorado. This guy was a youth pastor. Victimized a 14-year-old girl. Information came back to the church. They did nothing with it. Law enforcement finally found out about it. And guess what they did? Not only did they respond by arresting the guy, they arrested five members of the staff, including this guy's dad, who was a senior pastor. Y'all familiar with this, by the way? See, come on, my Christians. If you're a Colorado, you learn from other people's black eyes because, see, this is related also to the change in the Colorado reporting codes. Because these people, when that little girl came back and said, this guy molested me, and they thought about it, studied it, and they said that they actually contacted legal counsel, and legal counsel said, no, you don't have to report that because she's an adult. Oh, new Colorado law. If an adult shares with you having been sexually abused as a child, and the person that's the sexual abuser is still in a position of trust and authority, it's a mandatory report. And these guys got arrested for it. Now, laws like that for, you know, being a misdemeanor or a criminal prosecution for failure to report have been on the books forever. Post Penn State, they're now enforcing them. Okay, and I can show you eight or nine more examples of now in the primary places they're going, camps, schools, churches. Okay, those are my poster children for people forcing, enforcing the legislation saying mandatory report means mandatory report. Okay, go to Tulsa, Oklahoma and look up Victory Christian Center. Two staff members there did 30 days in jail for failure to report. Okay, I mean, it's like, don't play there. And by the way, it looks bad on a resume, okay? This guy's who rocked the, how many Baptists do we have in here? Baptists, come on. All right, how many of y'all are familiar with Doug Myers? Of course you're not, okay? Because Baptists don't learn from other Baptist black eyes. This guy cost the Florida Baptist Convention $12.5 million, okay? He had a Baptist pulpit in Alabama and he lost that pulpit for molesting little boys. Somehow, it bends the mind, he got a Baptist pulpit in Maryland. He lost that one too for, guess why? That's right, molesting little boys. 
He came to Florida, got into this one church that had a strong church planting effort going on, partnering with the association and the convention. And they trained him, they equipped him, he planted a church on the coast, and guess what he did? He molested the church secretary's son. She found out about Alabama and Maryland, she sued everybody, okay? So if you wanna know more about this, write that on that card. I want more information about Doug Myers. How did this line up and tag the Florida Baptist Convention for 12 and a half million, okay? It's predictable, but see, Baptists aren't learning from other Baptist black eyes. But once again, everybody loved Doug everywhere he went, okay? Difficult to believe about difficult to suspect. We could do this all day long. This is what rocked the Nazarenes in Oklahoma City. Okay, let's switch the gears, okay? Are all sexual abusers men? Answer, no. Okay, too much hesitation. We need to understand there are also women with deviant sexual desires. Okay, that, see, but see, that's hard, isn't it? See, we don't want to think of women as being deviant. I mean, women are nurturers. They're caregivers. They're maternal. They don't have deviant sexual desires. Like, well, actually, yeah. The numbers are skewed like this. I mean, Department of Justice tells us of convicted sexual offenders, 90% are men, 10% are women. I could probably dazzle you with some legal information to suggest to you maybe it's 80-20, but what's the point? If you said to me, Greg, isn't it true that most sexual abuse are men? I'd tell you straight up, you bet. Okay, but that's no reason to close your eyes to the other 10 to 20% of the risk. You don't get to line up 10 kids and say, all right, you eight, I got you. You two, good luck. Okay, that's not risk management. Okay, so from our standpoint, I just want you to know, my people, this one's hard. When we talk about visual profile, because you see, I've watched juries deliberate. And like the last time I saw one of these happen actually was in Amarillo, Texas. And... Um, we were about to try a case there against the Jehovah's Witnesses. And every time I go into a community, especially a small community, even though I'm from Lubbock, Amarillo's not my, that's not my community. So before we spend a whole lot of money trying a lawsuit, we bring in what's called a focus group. Okay, and this focus group, see, everybody wants to be on law and order, right? And so we'll send out these notifications to try to gather a collection of average Amarillans. And we were at the Ambassador Hotel. We got two of the ballrooms there, set it all up. And what we were gonna do is give them our case facts and see how they felt about it, okay? Because these are real conservative people in Amarillo, Texas, and I needed to know two things. Number one, would these set of facts get you mad? And number two, would you write a big enough check to justify myself, my leaving my family, you know, for that period of time and spending that kind of money, okay? So the last time we did this was suing the Jehovah's Witnesses. It was the Jehovah's Witness elder that had molested a seven-year-old little girl, a client of mine. After having molested a little four-year-old girl in Dumas, Texas, and gotten slapped on the hands and gone through a restoration program, okay? Now, when I gave that to both my control set of people, first of all, were they mad? Oh, they were. Something about diesel fuel pickup trucks and the guy had to die, all right? Okay, and the check, see, I needed to know, would the check be large enough? Because see, some people in Amarillo might think, I'm going to give you a real tricked out F-250 and we're good. It's like, so, so the check would have been big in either room. All right, so it's good. So we kept asking them questions to make sure the bias is like, would you get mad at my client if you found out she smoked weed? Would you get mad at my client if you found out that you know, she'd already been sexually promiscuous and said, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so while we were doing that, there was a lawyer named Amarillo that came to us and said, hey, I know you've got this team assembled. I've heard about that from some other colleagues of mine. And I've got this case that the DA refused to prosecute. And they've asked me to file suit. And I just, do you mind while I've got these people assembled, or you've got these people assembled, can I roll some facts by them to see how they'd feel about it? I said, sure, come on. His case facts were involving a very well-trusted organization in, in just west of Amarillo. And it involved a female house parent that was 32 years old having sexually abused a 14-year-old boy. Okay. He rolled these facts by him. Here's my question for you. Were they mad? Were they mad? I mean, they were confused at best. Okay, I mean, we're watching the deliberations because we're, we're audio and video recording. And I'm like, this guy wants money? Like, I'll buy him dinner. Tell him, well done, young man, 32. I wonder if they got photos. And it's like when, and this guy was horrified, but you know what, it's consistent with how, you know, you change the facts. 32-year-old male molester and 14-year-old girl, is it the same feedback? radically different, Radi it's just, you are fighting cultural expectations of what is offensive and what is not, okay? And so a lot of people, you know, they, but anyway, we, I remember going in and I said, dude, let me handle this. And I walked in the room and said, all right, I can tell you guys are struggling. I wanna remind you, 
32-year-old adult, 14-year-old child is felony sexual abuse. Okay, y'all tracking with me? Texas Code. They say, okay, now, try it again. And we left the room and then got to listen to the delivery. It sounded like this, like, yeah, it is felony. Why do you think she'd do that? I mean, why didn't she just go down to the denim and diamonds and pick up some fella and bring him home? I mean, is she ugly? I mean, is she stupid? Is she, okay, what are they doing? Yeah, they're trying to make deviant sexual desire make sense in a normal person's way of thinking and the math won't work, okay? They're trying to understand why she can't get a date. And as long as that's our analysis, we're going to miss it. Okay, let me show you what I mean by that. It's the education associations that we're getting most of this data from of teachers having sex with their students. Take this gal, for example. She's a teacher in Louisiana. What does that mean to me? That means she's educated, she's licensed, she's married, she has children, yet she taught at the Bible camp in Louisiana where she met a 13-year-old boy. She made him her special little helper and groomed him and then met him at his home after camp for sex. Does that make any sense? It won't, okay? You don't recognize the risk through visual profile. You understand the risk through behaviors, even if she's married and attractive and has kids, okay? What are those behaviors? That's where we're going next. But this gal was having sex with a 13-year-old girl that she was coaching. And it's like, what? Female molester, female victim? More often than you know, okay? No visual profile. It's not about this girl getting a date. Everybody tracking, okay? All of these women, in fact, this guy was having sex with middle school boys in her classroom, okay? All of these women have been convicted of having sexual activity with children in their classroom. These women are married and have children. This gal actually is not, doesn't have children, okay? It just, it bends the mind. Now, last misconception before we get into the grooming process, are all sexual abusers adults, okay? It's this concept called peer-to-peer -peer or peer-on-peer -peer sexual abuse. This is tripping up most of my churches on understanding that it exists, and certainly if it does come to your attention, whether it's reportable or not, okay? I gotta leave that topic alone because I'm actually going somewhere with this today, but if we had nine or 10 more hours together, I promise you we could have a good day, okay? Now, peer-to-peer -peer sexual abuse, child with child sexually aggressive behavior. And I'm not talking about the 17-year-old boy and his 15-year-old girlfriend. Okay, I'm talking about children that can be very, very young. The five-year-old and the four-year-old in the Christian school's bathroom, okay? Or the, the eight-year-old teaching the two six-year-olds how to perform oral and anal sex in the Leesburg, Virginia City day camp. Okay, it's like, it's, it's bend your mind and understand it could be small sexually aggressive children. Okay, now, let's, get, let's go back to that list we made. Will your background check help you solve this problem? Will your child check-in system help you solve this problem? Okay, will your six-month member rule help you solve this problem? Will your two-adult rule, this is a trick question, will your two-adult rule help you? Answer, maybe. It depends on what your two adults know. Because if on my playground I had two adults, but they had no idea what sexual abuse looked like beyond somebody with a white van and beanie babies. Okay? You see, information drives your creation of a safety system. Information drives how well your people participate in the system you create. Because you can be a super freak genius on all of this and it will not save your children because you can't be everywhere at the same time. It's equipping everybody to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Everybody tracking with me? Okay, I'm not gonna show you a bunch of pictures of sexually aggressive children. Let's get right into the key to the prevention. It's the grooming process, okay? Now, I'm gonna hit this very quickly. This is a discussion that generally needs to take longer than the time that I have permitted to deal with you, but I, I hope you understand why it was so important to talk about what we've talked about so far. In other words, it's, we have to understand what is keeping us from where we need to be because you won't be the only one. Chances are the people in this room do not have the stroke to go immediately go back into a ministry and make change. They're gonna rely on you heavily. You're gonna go back to them, I hope, with the tools you need to be able to show them this is where we have risk and I think I have some understandings of what we need to do to get to a place where we can have the discussion, okay? So that was the value of hour number one. Buckle up, here we go on the grooming process. 
I'm going to do this quickly, but with your first name, last name, and email address, I'm going to send you an online training link that's going to have its own segment on grooming process and peer-to-peer -peer sexual abuse. Okay? Here we go. Grooming process. First of all, 30,000 feet. Grooming is a two-part process. Okay? It's going to have the four subparts that we're going to talk about, but two at 30,000 feet, two, two big parts. When I ask some people, hey, have you ever heard the term grooming before? Most people tell you, yeah, I've heard the term grooming by now. Okay? And if I ask them, what do you think grooming means? Most of my people can answer that question too. Well, it's, a, it's a behavior someone goes through to prepare a child for sexual abuse. Okay? That's mostly right. Okay, exactly right is this. The sexual abuser will groom the child and the grooming of the child can look different depending on the age, sex, and circumstances of the child but is also busy grooming the gatekeepers, right? Who are the gatekeepers? Come on, who are they? You bet you are. Teachers, coaches, parents, babysitters, youth workers, anybody through whom the abuser has to go to gain access to a child is a gatekeeper. Now watch this. As I mentioned, the grooming of the child can look different depending on the age, sex, and circumstance of the child. The grooming of the gatekeeper generally always looks the same. It's the, the abuser trying to convince the gatekeeper that this person is helpful, trustworthy, and kind. Isn't that a kick in the pants? See, I want people to convince me they're helpful, trustworthy, and kind. You come up to me and say, hey, Greg, I'm a dirtbag. You want to do life? It's like, no, thanks. Okay, I'm not that smart, but I can hit that pitch. All right, but see, here's the dynamic of what's happening. Just to kind of back out a little bit and show you how we live life, because there's some things the abuser sees that we just as normal people don't. Okay, so in my world, I view my world as if I live on a wall, okay? And here's my wife. She stands at my right hand and we do life together. And see, the people on the wall of my life that I am in community with are people that I find helpful, trustworthy, and kind. Like my, my best friends, Hal and Jim. And here's their part of my Thursday morning Bible study guys, okay? We stand on that wall together and in community, we protect that which is important to us from that outside, which is dark and getting darker. Everybody tracking with me? Okay, so here's the big idea. If somebody, let's say, where I live, I live on about a two acre piece of property with a gate in the front, okay? And, and the, like half of Fort Worth knows the gate code before you think I live in a bunker, all right? But you see, if you know me, everybody knows you come up the back stairs and through the slider and you help yourself to whatever you want in the kitchen. Okay, nobody uses my front door. Okay, but every now and then, there'll be this very odd sound. Someone will knock on my front door. It really freaks the dog out too, okay? And it's like when all of a sudden I know immediately there's somebody that's inside my gate that doesn't know me, okay? And that bothers me. So I'll go get my aluminum baseball bat and the dog and we'll go to the door. Now imagine when I open the door, there's some dude there and says to me, it's like, I was watching your, your daughter swing and I think she's beautiful and I'd love to babysit her. What do you think about that? What is my response? Okay, let's, let's, let's soften it a little bit. Let's just make it a little different. Let's say, let's say that person says, you have a nice car. I'd like to borrow your car. What am I going to say? No, no, let the dog go, okay? So, but see, by contrast, let's say that it's my best friend, Hal. He goes, Greg, I know you're leaving to go do this, this uh, conference with Chuck. Okay, while you're gone, my car's in the shop. Do you mind if I borrow your car while you're away? What am I going to tell my best friend, Hal? Yeah, come on. In fact, you can drive me to the airport, all right? Here's the big idea. If you're on the wall of my life, the barriers of protection to my car go down. If you're on the wall of my life, I just gave you my keys. You now have access to everything I own, okay? You wanna borrow my lawnmower? No problem, okay? But see, the same dynamic happens with our children. We're living these busy, frenetic lives that if someone makes it onto the wall of our lives and we find them helpful, trustworthy, and kind, the barriers go down to those people. That's what the abuser's counting on. The abuser will not come to your front door and knock on the door and say, hey, can I babysit your kid? What the abuser knows is they've got to work to win your trust, find a place on the wall because that's when the barriers come down. Tracking with me? Okay, so we just need to understand, for the kid that gets molested in your world, chances are they groomed you first. And the grooming will look like helpful, trustworthy, and kind. Now, in my world, back to my wall, is it possible, even with all the things that I know and understand, is it possible that someone could fool me? 
there's a dirt bag that convinces me they're helpful, trustworthy, and kind and finds a place on the wall of my life. Is that possible? Absolutely it is, okay? But see, Kim and I decided in advance, right when Georgia was born, so much as it is within our power to do so, our child will not be sexually abused. But that's not enough to resolve that. See, what we had to do was put up the barriers of protection to protect her. Okay, so in other words, we're gonna build a fence. But here's the big idea. The type of fence you build depends on what type of rodent you wanna keep out, doesn't it? Okay, you see, I need to know what the risk looks like before I know how to build a wall. So for us, the grooming process is how the risk unfolds. So you see, grooming unfolds different with different variations in a swim program than it does in a special needs horseback riding camp. Okay, so there's some general common denominators of grooming, but your goal is to understand at your particular ministries and the type of sub ministries you offer in your programs, how will grooming unfold? Because that drives what you do to keep the risk low, okay? So for Kim and me, the barriers are up. Someone convinces us helpful, trustworthy, and kind. You fooled me, dirtbag, okay? But guess what? All of a sudden now, my car is at risk. My lawnmower is at risk, okay? My Australian shepherd, sorry, Lucy, but my child is not because I've resolved that this barrier goes up and stays up no matter if you're on the wall or not. And in fact, my friend Hal knows the same things I do because I've shared it with him. Jim, I know you love your kids as much as I love mine. Let's do this in community. Get the barriers up and hold the line. That's my vision for the church. Because my church home, my church family operates much the same way. So if I can take this information and with leadership that's key leadership, we can put the systems in place, then train everybody that wears the name tag that stands on that wall in a service capacity to everybody understands what the system is and their role in participating in it. Now people can fool me, but the children are never at risk. The vans, yeah. The flat screen TVs, maybe. Okay? The children, no. And when you put this in place and you do it in a meaningful way, it also becomes the also important visual deterrent for those people who come in and immediately understand you're not the lick and stick situation on that five things on the list. Okay? It allows them to go to the next place and self-select out where there is no list. All right? Because that's what the abuser is doing is wanting to know where is the barrier here. All right? Now, that's the concept. Let me show you how the flesh goes on the bones. All right? Step number one for the abuser, gaining access. All right? Now, this could be male or female. Remember, I'm going to use the he pronoun just because it's easier. Okay? Grooming process, gaining access. Now, this is a person with a deviant sexual desire, and it's generally going to be somebody with an age and sexual preference. So let's say, for example, Jerry Sandusky magically wound up at my church and wanted to volunteer working with kids. Will Jerry Sandusky want to volunteer with the toddlers? No. You see, he's going to gravitate toward middle school, early high school, because that's his age and sexual preference. Okay? So this person's going to gain access, and they're going to seek to career position, or in other words, they're going to need a name tag, whether they're paid or unpaid, to where they have a career position involving children within their age and sexual preference. Okay, just a little footnote right here. Most children are not abused because someone had a volunteer career opportunity involving children. Most children are victimized in what we call their core world, all right? Usually at home. And see, core world means a number of different things depending on the child. See, with some of your children, they're gonna be like mom, dad, little sister, a hamster. They play Scrabble a lot, okay? They don't go out much. All right, it's a very insular and closed core situation. Some kids, on the other hand, don't have places they live. They have places they stay. Okay? And in fact, who has access to them depends on who mom's dating or who big brother brings home. You know, what cousins have access to the house. And usually the younger the child, the less control they have over who has access. Okay? So most children are victimized in their core world. The reason why I'm wanting to list it this way is because I can't necessarily make it my job to solve what goes on at Timmy's home. I am laser focused on how I can build the barriers in the church. So all the remarks that I'm going to make are going to try to help put flesh on the bones to how the risk unfolds in the church, not in camp, not in youth sport, and not in social services, okay? So for the church, 
If somebody wanted to victimize a kid at my church, for example, you cannot come off the street and, and immediately have access to kids. You're going to have to go through an application process, whether you're a staff member or volunteer. Tracking with me still? Abuser knows that. Okay? The abuser will also be working hard to groom the gatekeepers by winning the trust of those people in those positions. That person will also be skilled at meeting a child's needs or knowing what they're interested in. Okay, so if it's somebody that's interested, for example, in 13-year-old girls, that'll be someone who knows a whole lot more about Justin Bieber's hairdresser than I do. Okay, it's like they'll know what codes they're using when they text one another. So they'll know what they're binging on on Spotify. They'll know how to drop into that line of communication easier than I can. You tracking with me still? Okay, now, here's an important concept I want us to understand. There's the information that you can see. Then there's the things that are taking place below the surface that you can't yet see. Okay? And I want to quickly show you, here's the anatomy of a train wreck from my position. Okay, so no matter where we go, when we evaluate a train wreck, all train wrecks, in my view, have three breakdowns. And I look for them and I find them. And here's what that looks like to me. When the wheels come off and I get the opportunity to get the information I need and start to ask the staff and the volunteers, key volunteers, you know, what they knew and when they knew it, you got three categories of breakdowns. The first one is where I get the five words I hate the most in my law practice. It's like when I tell them, it's like, all right, now here are the allegations, okay? Ice in the panties, little girls in the closet, okay? Did you see anything in your work with this staff member that would have led you to believe this kind of stuff was possible? Only after the fact, when it's in the media, this is the person that tells me, you know, Greg, now that you mention it, there's my five words, I hate them. Now that you mention it, that guy always was in the closet with that little girl. It's like, and? It's like, come on, dude. You don't play hide and seek with just one girl in a closet. You idiot. Okay, see, what's happening here is they saw the bad behavior. They just didn't understand the bad nature of why it was a problem. And so they tried to explain it using the idiot category. Okay, and we all have an idiot category. And I want to make that not an option. So really what I'm going to try to do with the grooming process is not just try to give you a laundry list of how many situations I've seen. Little girls in the closet, ice in the panty, the truth or dare games, the horseplay that involved nudity, the deep pantsing, all that. I can't make a long enough list. I still get people who call me up and like, well, wow, I've never heard that before. Bends the mind, okay? What I really want to do by contrast is give you enough of the information that's happening here so when something does pop the surface, idiot category is not an option, okay? And so I want to show you this so that if no matter how bizarre it happens, whatever you're able to see, I want us to see risk before someone's nude with a child. Tracking with me? Okay, so what I need is as much information as you possibly can have such that when you get what you see, you can recognize it as the problem that it could be immediately. Okay? So here's what the abuser is doing here, is work in the gatekeepers and is also, is you can't see the person skilled with a child, but that's part of the who that person is. When they finally take their deviant sexual desire, they've got their name tag, now they're going to seek to select one or more children. Okay? Gain access, then select one or more children. People, we're still here, okay? but we're getting close to the surface. Now, in terms of who is the child that might be selected, you see, we have some information about this. There are patterns to this, and there's some predictability in this. So if you ask me, Greg, who are the children that are most likely at risk? And Greg, why is that important to you? Well, I'm in youth ministry. It's important to me to understand which one of my children potentially needs a little bit more of my attention, needs a little bit more of my focus if they're getting the attention of somebody who has ill intent. Okay? So generally, that's a child who is unconnected. It's a child who's on the fringe or doesn't fit with the group very well. Now, is that a hard kid to spot? And you gather kids for about 90 seconds and you pick that kid out. For whatever reason they're being pushed out, they're generally easy to identify. But they're easy to identify for an abuser as well. Okay? So the abuser has gained access and is now looking for that child who's looking for someone to follow or trust. And sadly, I realized looking back, I was one of those kids. Okay? And it turns out that the person that finally took an interest in me was my wrestling coach. Okay? And I'm so glad that Coach Stamps didn't want to hurt me. 
It really was a significant role model in my life that made me a better human being because of that relationship. But see, for that, that young man, the single mom kid, looking for someone to follow and trust, if that person's an abuser, that's a real difficult in harm's way, okay? Kid from a broken home or a single parent home, and we know that single moms are being preyed upon, okay? And there's more single moms all the time. We can understand why, I think. I don't need to go into that much more deeply Okay? Now, here's where I want to spend a little bit of time. Kid who's involved in alcohol or drugs is a high-risk kid. Okay? Here's how that unfolds. Now, this could be a kid that's actually plugged into the group. But see, alcohol is the hook. All right? And here's, let me just give you an example of how one of these stories unfold. Because when people start to share their stories with me, I can usually finish it. But I remember this one mom called. Now, it's therapeutic sometimes for these women just to share and get it all out there and know that the person on the other end of the phone believes them, okay? So here she goes, and here's essentially her story. Single mom moved to a new community. It was a large high school, and her son was a freshman, okay? And this kid was a freak athlete. So this kid actually made the varsity baseball team at this big school as a freshman, okay? So guys, when you make the varsity baseball team as a freshman, who are your new friends? Juniors and seniors, that's right. And in this particular community, on the weekends, the juniors and seniors would get in their pickup trucks, they'd drive out in the woods, and they'd burn things, shoot things, and drink beer. Okay, then he started seeing the Instagram posts, the kid passed out with beer can. They dropped him off in the front yard, passed out one Friday night, honked the horn, that made mom real unhappy. Okay, she finally goes to the coach and said, now look, this is killing me. Ever since he made this baseball team, all this drinking, and he's disrespecting me as his mom and telling him this is dangerous, what does the coach say? He's a perp, by the way. He goes, ma'am, I got this. Tell you what, I'm gonna take all the guys on the team out camping this weekend and we're gonna talk about the dangers of alcohol and drugs and respecting authority. What does single mom say? Thank you, Jesus, okay? Picks up the young man right on time, but when he leaves that home, does he go to pick up any other kid? Uh Uh-uh, straight out of the woods. And on the way out to the woods, he goes, hey man, keep a secret? Yeah, I can keep a secret. No, man, I swear you won't tell. You can't even tell the guys on the team. Yeah, yeah, why what? I got a 12 pack in back. Okay, here's your moment of truth. What does the young man do? Does he call 911? Oh, this is sweet. We're gonna go out camping. We're gonna drink things and shoot things. It's gonna be sweet. All right, now, on the first camp out, was there any inappropriate sexual touch? Not the first one, okay? What's happening here? See, the coach wants to know, will the secrecy hold? Two weeks go by, he hadn't told anybody. Coach goes by and says, hey man, you go camping this weekend? Yeah, man, you bring the beer, roger that. Picks him up out in the woods. Now there's a lot of drinking and a lot of impairment and a lot of pushing through this young man's objections while he's impaired into some, into some awful sexual touch, okay? Now, for that young man to go home and tell mom about the inappropriate sexual touch, what does he also have to tell mom about? The drinking. How does he know mom feels about the drinking? Hates it. Don't, don't miss the added dynamic, but so the way our culture throws around labels for same-sex behavior, see, for this young man to come back and tell anybody about that and risk the labels is enough to keep a young man quiet forever. All right, do you see that? Alcohol and two campouts, okay? So what we need to understand, to an abuser, alcohol and weed, the weed's not the same kind of impairment, it has the dual benefit to the abuser of impairment and secrecy. Now, the next thing on the list is, no, no, just to be clear, tobacco can also make the list, though it doesn't impair in the same way. So it's like the younger the child is, the more the use of cigarettes has a rule-breaking component to it. Dip just doesn't seem to impact parents the same way cigarettes do. I guess because you can burn yourself, I don't know, okay? So we just need to know the abuser is going to find whatever it is in that child's world that is the rule breaking in that world. What privilege that I can give that the child would get in trouble for because it's the cloaking secrecy then changing the behavior, okay? Porn is huge because it has the dual benefit to the abuser of it's secretive by nature and it arouses, okay? So once I tell people, hey, every case that we've handled involving a male molester and a male victim has involved porn, Everyone. Like, wow, okay, well, you know what, Greg? We're gonna ban homosexual porn. I'm like, no, 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 don't miss me on this one. It's most of the times not homosexual porn. You see, the abuser's not gonna try to convince a 12-year-old boy that nude men are attractive. It's just to arouse the child, okay? The abuser will take it from there. 
given the cultural also disadvantage that we have, the average age of regular consumption of pornography now is 10 years old. And the average age of a kid with a smartphone is like three, okay? So we, just, we are losing this battle. We just need to understand what tools are in the belt of the abuser so we can be busy about building our fence. Now, let me just, let me make a comment here because here as professional risk managers, here's what I want to change forever for you. You're going to continue to receive information like from the media, but I want you to read it differently. Okay, with the information I just gave you, let me just say for example, just, I mean, go with me on this hypothetical. You show a 12-year-old boy pornography and no one else is around as a bumper on the bowling alley, does the 12-year-old reject you out of hand? Uh Uh-uh. You show a 12-year-old girl pornography, what does she do? She squirrels up her face and says you're a perv, okay? Okay, see, the abuser who prefers boys there's a certain rhythm you see in the reports of abuse. And so when you're building your fence, the more you understand about the grooming process of those people wanting to victimize boys is oftentimes going to look different than the person wanting to victimize a girl. Let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to show you guys, this is media. It's plucked right out of the media report. Okay? This guy's a Baptist pastor, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Tennessee. He's alleged to have used alcohol, marijuana, and pornography to groom and molest boys. Does that surprise you that it's a male molester, male victims, alcohol, porn, weed? There's your trifecta, okay? I just want to challenge you. Every time you read an article relating to a male molester that involves boys, look for alcohol, pornography, and weed, okay? If I'd have told you this was a male molester and wouldn't have told you whether it was a boy or a girl and I said he used alcohol, tobacco, and weed, you'd know it was a boy, wouldn't you? Because an abuser's not necessarily going to use pornography to groom a girl. Tracking with me on that. See, the more information you know, the better it equips you to do your job to reduce risk. That's just an example. Now, let me keep rolling this train forward. Abuser's going to gain access. Now, let me just finish that comment then because I'm going to go there in just a minute. Did you notice when I was talking about the numbers of victims, 150 when they're boys and 52 when they're girls? Remember that? Now, I've had a lot of people approach me afterwards and say, Greg, I mean, both of those numbers are unacceptable, but why is there such a disparity? Okay, well, you know what? In my view and the studies that I've read and the experiences I've had in these cases is, it's consistent with the way God wired us. How did God wire guys? He made us visual and easy to stimulate. How did he wire girls? For relationship, emotionally for relationship. Okay, so if somebody wanted to abuse a boy, it's about tactile, it's about visual, it's, it's, it's impairment and pornography and touch. Okay, see, it's a quick trip to a place to where there can be inappropriate sexual touch. But you see, for the girl, there's the added step of having to create relationship. Now, it's fake and it's going to be betrayed, But you see, it takes more time. Now, if you wanted to victimize a 12-year-old girl, and you know that there's that, and the abuser knows this, and there's the added requirement of relationship, how are 12-year-old girls having relationship? How are 14-year-old girls having relationship? Through their devices and social media. Okay, so here's the next challenge for you. When I read a a report of sexual abuse where it's a male molester and all I get to know is that there was Facebook, there was cell phones, there was exchange of nude photos, and there was social media, what is am I likely going to understand? Female victim. Do you see that? So it's like information drives our understanding of the risk, which drives your preparation of the barriers. All right? Now, let's go back to our slides. Three of the four-step process. Number one, gain access. Number two, select one or more children. Number three, start introducing nudity and sexual touch. In other words, start pushing in to see. It's this idea that, you see, we all have a personal sense of appropriateness, okay? And that can be changed in a child. So what the abuser is going to do is what's called barrier testing. It's to find out where is that child's sense of appropriateness. Touch, talk. It could be through the joking. It could be showing the child pornography. It could be through, you know, inappropriate horseplay. Okay, but see that kind of activity if someone is a girl is gonna look different than if someone's a boy. Remember when I told you earlier the grooming of the child would look different depending on the age, sex, and circumstance of the child? 
See, if somebody wants to victimize a four-year-old girl, they're not going to use weed. Okay, for a small child, the grooming process involves much more touch and playful tickle-like games. Okay? So there's a lot of time that I would want to spend breaking all these down and letting you see how this unfolds depending on who the victim range is that you're trying to protect. But for right now, I want to stay at 25,000 feet and let you know that this is probably the most, this is the slide we could spend a week on, okay? And just going case to case to case, letting you understand how this unfolds given different circumstances. But as a general rule, the abuser is going to use sexual joking and test discussion, playful touch, and when you have somebody that wears a name tag that has the ability to create culture such that they can start introducing the games and the types of language and the types of talk and the types of things that are communicated, and it's very difficult to supervise, especially in the middle school and high school ministry where usually those are like separated from the rest of the church. It's almost like we'll approve your budget as long as there's numbers and there's no ski master, you know, police come to the check out what y'all are doing, all right? But let's get, let me... Let me make, let me kind of give you an example to kind of stitch all this together. We responded to a situation involving a camp and it was required by their insurance company that they contact us, okay? And I remember getting a call from their CFO and they said, Greg, we, we're, we're having a difficulty and our insurance company insisted that we call. He said, I don't know, I'm reading about you in the paper. And they said, well, Greg, we want you to know, we've heard some of the things that you've taught on, but we really think we are the first place on the planet that was truly blindsided by this risk. I was like, well, roger that. Tell you what, let me work with your staff for a little while and then let me see if I get those five words I hate so much, okay? So we flew in, Kim and I, and we met with our staff, spent about an hour and 20 minutes with them, walking through the grooming process in some painful and getting in some detail, all right? And then started giving them some examples about how the grooming process unfolds in camp-like settings to kind of prime the pump because then I'm gonna ask you, all right, with that as a framework, here are the allegations that you're dealing with do you remember anything about this person that would have led you to believe that this type of behavior was possible? I mean, anything at all. And then there was that uncomfortable silence. And then somebody said, well, come to think of it. I was like, that's still five words. Okay, well, come to think of it, there was the naked basketball game. I was like, now people pay me a lot of money to keep a straight face. And, I, and it's like, and, and no, important. Two girls over on the edge went like this. Okay, and so they're all going, yeah, there was the nude basketball, there was that. It's like, all right, well, look, man, I'm from Lubbock, and maybe we pick up a game of nude basketball different than y'all do. I mean, can you help me understand, you know, oh, yeah, that did sound dumb, didn't it? It's like, well, we were all playing basketball, all of a sudden this one guy walks up and is like, okay, you guys, you know what you're going to We're going to play naked, yeah! Now, three of the kids, like negative Ghost Rider, and just left, okay? Now, is the, is the abuser interested in them anymore? Uh uh. The rest of the kids are like, okay, that's weird. Oh, but he's my counselor. Uh, and they started playing basketball naked. Now, was there any kid dropped on center court and sodomized right there in front of everybody? And says, no. What's happening here? You see, it's a selection process. It's the abuser wanting to know if I can make nudity a game, who will play? Because at a camp, don't miss this, it's a week long period. Once they understood the pattern, there was a lot of radical nudity in their games on the Sunday, Monday, and then it narrowed down who he wanted to continue to push barriers on, and then by Saturday, that's where your abuse was happening, okay? It had to be accelerated because of the short period of time. Now, it's like, all right, nude basketball, we'll come back to that if we need to. Anything else besides nude basketball? It's like, well, there was the streaking. Okay, good, streaking, what is streaking? It's just stupid nudity. But see, from the abuser's standpoint, he just wants to know if I can make it a game, who will play, okay? Because that helps him understand who are going to be the, prior tar the primary targets to pursue for the rest of the week. It's like, okay, streaking, got that. Anything else? Well, there was the skinny dipping after the water skiing, okay, Roger. Anything else? Well, there was a time he drove up naked on the four-wheeler. You see, at this point, I just quit riding, all right? And it's like, well, okay, anything else? Blindsided. Okay, I was like, well, you know, there were the naked Bible studies in the hot tub. I'm like, really? What were we studying? Okay. It ultimately became that it's like pop, 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 group Bible study in the hot tub. Then there was enough touch happening underneath the water for him to determine which kid was going to come back for the one-on-one -on -one Bible study in the hot tub naked. And so, I mean, if you got the Bible, you got Jesus, then it's okay. That was the primary place of molestation by the end of the week. Okay. It's like, whoop, there it is. I could have scripted it. 
okay? But nonetheless, in response to that, and by the way, depositions have gone bad, all right? But in response to that, okay, all right, people, new policies and procedures with a good understanding of this risk and how it unfolds in camp and not just in camp, on this camp, given your physical plant, new policies and procedures, new screening systems, training that changes what everybody understands so that you can have a safety system and they know where they participate in it. And I came out and actually trained all of these thousand college kids live that next summer. It's like, all right, people, you know what I want from you? I want this to be the safest place on the planet for the next 90 days. Are you all with me on that? Yeah. I mean, so we walked through the grooming process and walked through their policies and procedures, what I expected and what are the danger zones, what are the places that change in terms of risk, whether the sun's up, sun is not, you know, or the water sports, et cetera. But I remember finishing with this. All right, here's the last thing I want from you. For the next 90 days, I don't want to see your butt. I remember they were kind of like, did he just say that? It's like, yeah, I don't want to see your butt. Okay, not accidentally, not playfully. What I mean by that is like, I don't know, deep pantsing, no ice water over the shower on a kid, no cup checks, no bra popping, no streaking, no, you know, truth or dare games, no nude sports of any kind. Okay, it's like everything I could think of. Okay, I don't want to see your butt. In, 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 no matter how that happens, y'all give me that, all right? Yes, sir. It's like, have a good summer. Okay, it's about... Ten days later, I get a call from leaders that says, Greg, we need to talk. Like, okay, go. Said, well, you know, we had this hero on the hilltop, you know, one of our staff members, and he sees these guys going down to the sea dudes, and they got two counselors and a group of kids, and he yells, hey, you guys, and he moons them. And it's at that point I realized I never said don't moon. Though I did say I don't want to see your butt, okay? But maybe a few years later, these people would have gone, hee, 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 and mooned him back, but not now, Okay? Now they understand, uh-oh, okay, I need to go. No, 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 I know where you need to go. I'll take the kids to the lake. You go talk to the people we need to talk to. So he tells the administrator, an hour later, this hero's in the administrator's office crying and swearing I'm not a sexual abuser. And an hour after that, he's driving home, okay? But here's my question for you. Was he a sexual abuser? Was he? Yeah, I have no idea. Maybe he was just an idiot, Okay. But kind of my world is sexual abusers and idiots both go home, okay? I'm not going to make it my job to tell which one you are. I want to understand what the risk is. I want to put something in place. I want to train my people to say, please, these are the bumpers on the bowling alley. Don't play with me here. I need people that understand, appreciate this risk and will play with me. Otherwise, I can't use you, okay? So in that circumstance, my three-part breakdown, one, two, three, I had all three breakdowns. After we had the system in place, everything worked exactly the way it was supposed to. I had somebody show their butt and I had people know exactly what they were called to recognize, exactly what they were supposed to do with that information and administration knew exactly what to do next. That's my goal, okay? So from this standpoint, I hope that gives you kind of the idea of how some of this might unfold in real life. And then the last piece of it, well, let me just land the plane on this concept. I'm gonna give you this piece of information alone. Here's a pop quiz based on what I told you 15 minutes ago. Here's the headline in West Virginia. Youth pastor and girls soccer team coach arrested in Williamstown, that's West Virginia. Okay. What age and sexual preference? Soccer coach of girls tells me what? Girls, okay. Youth pastor, not children's pastor, tells me what? Junior high, you bet, okay. Here's what the article goes on to say. On Friday, search warrant was executed, blah, blah, blah. He freely confessed that he assumed a fake Instagram and Snapchat account of a 16-year-old boy named Ethan Jones, at which time he communicated with an identified minor in a sexually explicit manner, sent said minor photographic videos. Sent him pictures of himself. Okay, sent videos of himself. But see, that's the big idea. If the victim is a girl... It's the idea of relationship. You create the relationship through the social media. So he's not trying to trick this girl out of her quiet time to come down behind the movie theater. He tricks her by posing as a 16-year-old boy to engage her in the sexual content conversations teenage girls are already having, okay? And tries to then woo her into a place where they can meet. This one got cut short, all right? But he was already in the sexual conversation and the exchange of nude photos and videos of each other, okay? That's what grooming looks like when it's a girl. It's the same thing when you want to talk about this guy, he disappeared. You can go Google this guy, Chad Foster at Second Baptist Church in Houston, okay? It's a huge church, same deal. Teenage girls is a victim. They pull the cell records, they always do. 
And when they do, then you can watch the spiral of communications just deteriorate into the sexual content, then the conversation, then the you know, request for nude photos, and then the meet me, then go to Central, I mean, the Victoria's Secret and take some pictures of yourself trying some stuff on. And it's, a, it's predictable. Your risk managers know what that looks like, okay? Last step of the grooming process, keeping the victim quiet. And just know this, they're very good at it. But know this in particular, number one reason why sexual abuse victims don't report, guess what it is? No one will believe me. You know what's sad about that? Most of the times we don't. You know how many times on average a child needs to report sexual abuse before an investigation will start? Guess how many times? Seven, seven times, okay? Now, contrast that with what the Center for Disease Control tells us. Between 92 and 98% of all allegations made by children are factual, even if the child recants. We need to be ready to believe the child. And remember, the reporting requirements in Colorado, Texas, South Carolina, and every other state in the United States asks you to report, requires you to report suspicions of abuse. So if a child shares with you information that's a suspicion of abuse, we pick up the phone, okay? Now, I'm gonna skip this and get right to where we're gonna land the plane. I've got 12 minutes left, and you know what? After having spent the time with you talking about the grooming process, so in other words, the, the what and then the how, the how just makes sense, okay? Because once we understand the risk, we can understand and have a conversation now about what kind of fence to build. So when I ask this question, what do our churches do at present? We can grade our paper if you want to. All you people that have video cameras and think that's the answer to the problem, Remember going to this huge church in Houston that bragged about their new $6 million children's facility? And I walked in, I'm a nice guy, okay? I said, hey, this is awesome. What do you do here to protect children from sexual abuse? I remember this woman that was in charge of that. She was like, all right, lawyer pants. Okay, come with me and I'll show you. She walked me down the hall. She used this key. She opened this big room. And I'm telling you what, there's like 45 video monitors in this room. It was impressive. Just made me think of like March Madness in one room, okay? She, I said, well, this is impressive. She goes, yep, there's a camera in every bathroom or outside of her bathroom, in every classroom. There's no corner that we can't see and da-da-da-da-da. It's like, awesome. Hey, there's a chair here. Who sits in this chair? Okay, well, Bob does. Okay, what does Bob know about the grooming process of a preferential offender? He goes, nothing, why? What do you want Bob to see? Okay, was well, he just looking for ski masks and box cutters, people running down the hall with a kid like that? Okay, it's like... Otherwise, all you're doing is you're, you're capturing exhibits A, B, and C. What you need to do for these videos to be a part of your safety system that protects children is teach this person what the grooming process looks like so they know risk as it unfolds, okay? So that's just in terms of if video makes your list and you're putting some level of security in that, there's still information that drives that as being a proper thing that belongs on the list to protect children. Frankly, it can be harmful without the right information. All right. Now, here's the list that I want to see. And this is actually in that handout and it's actually in your notebook. Now you can tell by now I'm a list maker. Okay, and it's in list form. And it's got sub bullet points under the list items. Okay, but lists aren't good enough for this. All of us can make lists. Let me just walk through the list real quick and then I want to show you how it looks in function. Okay? Sexual abuse awareness training. That's the information, all right? And in my opinion, that's the key to any, rec any, any system to reduce risk, okay? Because the sexual abuse awareness training, see in Texas, sexual abuse awareness training is a term of art. It's in the code section. A state approved sexual abuse awareness training in the state of Texas, for example, is a training that covers these topics. Facts and misconceptions about sexual abusers, abuser characteristics, the grooming process, common grooming behaviors, peer-to-peer -peer sexual abuse, and the importance of reporting. Doesn't that sound like it would be valuable information for everybody wearing your name tag to have? That's why it's required in Texas to be in a youth camp, day camp, child care organization, daycare, college, university, private school, or I mean charter school or public school. Okay, the only unregulated places in Texas left are in youth sports and youth ministry. And they're coming. Okay? So for all of you who haven't heard the term sexual abuse awareness training, that is the foundation of any safety system to protect children from sexual abuse. Okay? Information is key. All right, not only to building your system, but having your people understand how they participate in your system. All right, your skillful screening. Now, this is where the church is the weakest, my friends.
okay? And I'll talk to you a little bit about the skillful screening in just a minute. Appropriate background checks, once again, we have to do them. They just cannot be on your list alone. Tailored policies and procedures, the key word there being tailored. In other words, it needs to be a glove that fits the hand of your ministry. If you're not the Cub Scouts, don't use the Cub Scouts policies, okay? And finally, monitoring and oversight is a lawyer way of saying we have to do what we say we do. This can't be something that they got a near miss on the church down the street, so we put something in place, and as soon as the urgency wanes, so does my effort. Okay, we got to be doing this until Jesus comes back. All right, there's the list. Let's look at it in, in a picture form. I'm very visual. And by the way, so you're not drawing stick people, I'll send you these slides, okay? Because I don't want you to like go draw people and then try to communicate to your people that, hey, we got to do this. Because see, one thing I know about churches is we can't do anything without creating a committee, okay? So you're going to have to draw back and communicate with other people, and I want to help you do that, all right? Here's how this works. This is my applicant, okay? And this is what I call my sheep pen, where I gather my children in whatever form, all right? And this line is my way of trying to depict a sheep pen gate, all right? So here's the big idea. Here's where I gather my children, and there should be a gate on that sheep pen, and I'm going to stand in front of that gate, all right? And there's my applicant who wants access to my sheep. So here's the best opportunity that I have before you're in with my sheep to determine, do you have wolf-like qualities? Everybody tracking with me still? In other words, I don't want to know you're a wolf by seeing you eat one of my sheep, all right? So here's where I have the most of my work to do to determine, do you have wolf-like qualities? Okay, so some of your safety system is going to happen on this side of the sheep pen gate in determining are there wolf-like qualities, and there are other parts of your safety system that happen on this side of the sheep pen gate. Here's how your list falls down into function, okay? On the front side of the sheep pen gate, that's when it's our responsibility to screen. In other words, your screening is your wolf check, okay? So in other words, what is screening? Okay, what I'm looking for when I come into an organization, I'm looking for application, reference checks, and interviews. And you know what I know about the church? We stink at this. Okay, we just do. We're still doing probationary periods. Y'all heard that before, probationary period? And it's like when looking at that person with that serious face, like, all right, dude, you're going to be in with the second graders. We're going to need you here every week. Okay, and you're going to need to know how to work that flannel board. Okay, and that Daniel in the lion's den story. And if you can do that for 90 days, we'll turn your, your name tag from paper to plastic. And you got to make that look again. Okay, probationary periods stink. Okay, because what are the abusers doing? They're grooming the gatekeepers. They excel at probationary periods, okay? And so we think we're doing something effective and we're playing right into the risk and think that guy's a model citizen and that person's our primary risk, okay? So your screening is generally what the church is weak at. So no matter where you find yourself, in other words, some of you might be saying, well, we have an application, at least we do for staff, but we don't have them for volunteers. Okay, well, know this. Insurance companies tell us as it relates to sexual abuse risk, the bad actor, 50% of the times, the bad actor is a volunteer. 30% of the times it's a staff member and 20% of the time it's another child. Okay, so 50% of your risk is for the people that we're afraid to ask them for anything. Okay, that's not good risk management. Okay, so we create a fence. It is equally applies to staff members and volunteers. So in other words, we got to know what those systems look like, but it's not enough to just have forms. I can give you great forms. My wife, the employment lawyer and a sexual abuse expert can write great forms. But if you don't know what the high risk indicators are, you won't know when you've gathered them, okay? That one of the case, another case we handled in Amarillo, actually, there's not a whole bunch of molesters in Amarillo. Okay, don't get me wrong. That I remember taking a deposition of an administrator. See, I'm gonna need your policies and procedures and I'm gonna need the file of the alleged abuser. So at the deposition showed up, she gave me this thick, this file is about an inch thick, manila folder, had a cover sheet on it with all the things that they required with little boxes out in there with check marks and initials and dates. So that everything they required on somebody to work at this particular person as a caseworker at this organization, everything was there. And she slid it across the table and was like, there you go, lawyer boy. Okay, it took about 20 minutes to read through this. And she was telling me everything is in there. It's like, well, you know what? Yes, everything was but you have no idea what a high risk indicator was or you would know that everything in this file is screaming sexual abuser. You just didn't know it, okay? So it's not enough for us to have good paper on our screening. We also need to know what those high risk indicators are. 
That is what we call a skillful screening training. Okay, so there's skillful screening forms, but there's also the corresponding training to teach people what are those high-risk indicators I'm looking for? What are those, what they might look like on an application versus a reference check? What is an evasive answer? What is a question that comes behind that evasive answer? So there's a mother load of information available and I can provide that to you all online. Okay, so I just want you to know, I don't want to just scare the snot out of you. It's like, hey, you have cancer, have a nice day. Okay, I'm about equipping the church, but I need to first tell you what equipping directions go, all right? So screening, now here's your awareness training. So some people might ask me, great, you know, awareness training, right. We deliver it online. We, have, we train about 12,000 people per month online, okay, for 4,500 organizations across the country, secular and faith-based. But if you've got this person right here that's got ill intent, I've had some people ask me, oh, Craig, you're going to teach a sexual abuser how to abuse? Don't you have a problem with that? It's like, no. They already know, okay? I need my normal people to know how they abuse, okay? So what I want to do is equip everybody in the sheep pen with the eyes to see and ears to hear. And if I just happen to have someone with, with ill intent that wants to apply in my program, and I'm going to tell them unapologetically, hey, all right, great, we need more help in the middle school. Here's an application I'm going to need you to fill out. And if they look at that and they realize there's some questions designed to elicit high-risk responses, and that's enough to make them go away, you know what I call that? Christmas morning, Okay, Merry Christmas. You've done nothing but hand them a piece of paper unapologetically and they self-select it out. Okay, but let's say it's like, yeah, I'm gonna I need you to fill this out and I'll send you an online sexual abuse awareness training link. And when I, my system shows that you've received that and completed that, let's set up a time for an interview. Let's say that this person with ill intent actually drops back and actually takes the training. Okay, it's not like I'm teaching them how to abuse, but what I am teaching them is that everybody in this sheep pen has the eyes to see and ears to hear what, engage, what behavior you will engage in to victimize a child. So at this juncture, before this person does anything further, what do I want that person to do? Self-select out. That's the day after Christmas, okay? Now, so there's work to do on the front side, but let's say that whatever level, here's the spectrum of where you might find yourself on that safety system. If you're here, tell me what you need, let's start moving. If you're just like right next to where I want you to be, I'm so very proud of you, let's go that extra 20 feet. But here's the big idea. Whatever you find yourself on this, well, keep moving. This is where the church is usually weak. But once we do whatever we do to determine whether that person has wolf-like qualities, once that person passes into that sheep pen, now your policies and procedures take center stage. Okay? Because your policies and procedures should be that document which describes what is and is not appropriate behavior in the sheep pen. Everybody tracking with me? And it needs to be a glove that fits your hand. If you want a sample of a youth ministry's policies and procedures, for example, I'll give you one. I'll send you a sample, I mean, the sexual abuse awareness training link, and you'll see how those dovetail together. Okay, so you tell me what you want, I want to equip you. You have a youth sport kind of program involved with your ministry, ask me for a youth sport sample policy. Okay, now, some people have asked me, Greg, why does policy and procedures and awareness training go together? I mean, if I take the awareness training here, you tell me I have to take it again? It's like, no, 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 no. You see, when I'm addressing those people that are already in active ministries, what I know about you is you have people that are already wearing your name tag. So if you come into a circumstance and you're like, wow, we don't have a lot in place. We've got some work to do. Please don't come into your existing people and just drop new policies and procedures on them, okay? I don't care if they're my policies. They're good policies and procedures because there's something about the human condition that I don't care if we love Jesus, we have pitchforks and torches, okay? And see, in addition to that, my wife tells me there's two types of people, okay? There's rule followers like me and there's non-rule followers like her, okay? Now, who are my rule followers? I'll bet most of you, okay? You see, but you gotta ask it that way because if I asked him if you know, raise his hand, non-rule followers won't do it, okay? And my wife's one of them and she'll tell you policies and procedures, forget about it. They're merely suggestions which may or may not apply to me depending on my mood and my outfit, okay? Now, some of your non-rule followers are your best children's people. Okay, it's almost like they're living life a little larger and kids see it, okay? But for your non-rule followers, you have to give them the why before they'll give you the what, okay? So the awareness train, don't ever try to give people policies or procedures without giving them the why first. And if you do it well, and I hope that you would find that, like when I send you a sample online training link, 
I want it to do well because you usually only get one good shot at this. Because when people try to roll out sexual abuse change and they do it poorly, trying to come in and doing it again is very, very difficult. Okay? So that's what it looks like. We create all the online systems to be able to deliver that. And in addition to that, where's my Denton guy? Denton. I mean, you're a Bible church guy. Did you go to DTS? Okay, well, anyway, we're, te- we're combining, we're partnering with DTS to create curriculum. So we've just filmed 20 hours worth of material that's being broken down into seminary format. Dallas Theological Seminary is going to deliver it for course credit. We're creating Ministry Safe Institute to deliver it to my pastors who don't care if they get course credit or not. They just need the information. And they can't count on me being there for 20 hours at a time during their world. And especially if it's drinking from a hydrant to go back and re-get whatever they need. Okay? So good information is coming. We should have that done by November. In the meantime, there's a whole lot more I want to say to you. We've created some online systems. In other words, if I'm going to tell you you need to be doing this, I want to show you how to be able to deliver it. I want to be respectful, though, of Chuck. And so if you want information about this, you tell me what you want, tell me what you need. I'll show you how you can deliver the awareness training and do it easily. I'll show you how you can get the skillful screening training online and get it easily. I'll show you where you can access the forms. In other words, you got to want to. If you need information to go and grab that committee and have them join you on that same type of learning curve that you are, I can send you a link to a how to build a safety system, which is a seven part tutorial. It's about an hour and a half long, which is a, it's a version of what we just gave you. So in other words, you tell me what you need depending on where you are and I want to equip you. All right. So Chuck, you know, come up and land this plane.